so grateful that you're making this contribution to us. Well, thank you very much for taking the interest to, uh, to record this uh, oral history. I haven't uh, written any of this down, so this is really a primary document, in effect. Wonderful. And you were saying you're planning on contributing it as well? Yes, I'll uh, add it to the, uh, my family's archives at the uh, Washington Holocaust Memorial Museum. Actually, the museum that recently had the assault with the, um, the old Nazi yes. Uh, yes. man who came and killed the security guard there. Yes. So where shall we start today? I should explain who I am, I suppose, and what my origins are. Oh, well, um, I'm not from Montreal, Montreal, originally. I'm here uh, since 23 years. I've raised a son here in, as a Quebecois Jewish, uh, first Quebecois Jewish person. Uh, and uh, I'm originally from uh, Toronto, downtown Toronto, where my parents came to live uh, after the Holocaust because both my parents were uh, um, survivors in the sense that they had escaped from the Holocaust itself. And they escaped from each of the ghettos uh, to which they were confined. So uh, they weren't uh, survivors of the death camps, which is usually what the term survivor refers to, but it has come to mean as well those people who survived by escaping beforehand or during the Holocaust or who were hidden during the Holocaust. Uh, there's all sorts of conditions uh, of survival which, uh, which led to uh, about 250,000 survivors in Europe and about 500,000 survivors who um, escaped into the Soviet Union during the war, which is what my parents did from Poland, from each of the cities of Warsaw and Lublin, and uh, they're fairly close to the border with Russia there, and so they were able to cross over by, uh, by getting as close to the border as possible with public transport, but in a hidden way, because tickets were not allowed to be sold to Jewish people at the time. And, and then um, when they got close enough to the border, they walked the rest of the way across the border. And uh, in each of my parents' cases, they had a somewhat different context. Uh, um, for instance, um, my mother, who was in the Warsaw Ghetto, received a message from her brother who had escaped and had set up a camp in the forest in Russia across the border and was um, setting up a what in effect would be called an underground railway so that he could um, you know, counsel people on how to escape from the ghetto and where to go, because a lot of people didn't even think of escaping, sure. because they didn't know where to go. And uh, there was there were no countries in, in the in the Western world who were accepting Jewish refugees uh, before the war, and not even during the Holocaust, and even for a year after the Holocaust, the refugees were not accepted in the Western countries such as Canada. None is too many. Yes, that book uh, documents that. And the uh, United States. And during the war, of course, there was that boat, the SS San Louis, which attempted to uh, bring some refugees into Canada, the United States, and Cuba. And they were rejected in all the countries to which they came. And they went back and brought uh, the, um, those uh, refugees back to France and a large percentage of those refugees were then sent to death camps uh, subsequently. So even though my father had a sister who was already living in Toronto and uh, was sponsored as an immigrant, um, it still took a year of waiting in the refugee camp in order to get the visa from Canada. And um, each of my parents uh, were in the same refugee camp where they met in uh, Breslau, northeastern Germany, a portion of land that was uh, that was taken over by the uh, U.S. administration, U.S. Uh, military, and uh, there were um, 
uh, it was an area that was depopulated of its uh, German population, who were made into refugees, sent into uh, central Germany. The Jewish refugees were put into that uh, territory for a while. It lasted about three years in total that there were uh, refugee camps there. And then that territory was sliced off Germany and given to Poland. Now, of course, the territory could have been given to the Jewish refugees to solve the refugee problem right then and there, but it was not even conceived of at the time. So, I was conceived in the refugee camp there in Breslau and carried across the, uh, the Atlantic, you know, by boat at the time. It took a month's passage. And my parents came in 47 and I was born in 48, in the spring of 48 on what's called Erev Pesach, which is the, uh, the evening uh, of uh, Passover. And here I am, 61 years later, survived. And my parents are both gone now. They were quite old. My mother was quite aged, you know, when I was born, so I was the one and only child born to my parents. How old were your parents when they met? Uh, they must have been, my mother must have been 36, and my father 37 or so. And, uh, and I was born when she was 37. And in the refugee camp, you know, right after the war, amongst the refugees, you know, you know people you know, set themselves up as couples you know, immediately, and, and a third of the women were, were pregnant. We were you know, the first yes. baby boom, post-war baby boom, you know, right then and there, just like that. Because during the war there weren't any babies they were made because it was impossible. It was impossible to survive and you know and, and have a family at the same time. Usually, if uh, if uh, parents were um, escaping, they usually you know had their children left with uh, some you know uh, local family in order to uh, ensure their survival and to, and to risk their own you know afterwards. So uh, that was the beginning of the new life. In no. Toronto, because in of Toronto, the yeah. Links well, in the refugee home. camp started, and then in Toronto afterwards. And then, how we were received is very, very important, because um, you know, the it wasn't just government policy that uh, Jewish refugees were not allowed into Canada. This was also the popular sentiment. Uh, Jewish refugees were not welcome in Canada at the end of the war neither by the uh, general population, which was mostly Christian at the time, nor even by the Canadian Jewish population. The uh, general population um, used our legal definition of uh, displaced persons, DP, to, and it became a slur, you know, DPs, you know, was a slur name, it was, you know, an insult. And uh, usually, uh, English uh, people would refer to us as not just DPs, but as fucking DPs. It was, you know, a very strong emphasis on the derogatory sort of nature of it. And then in the Canadian Jewish population, which were generally uh, well integrated, uh, partially assimilated, uh, to a good extent, you know, middle class uh, families, they referred to us as DP Nicks. Because in Yiddish, if you say a nick after a word, that means it's like a diminution of the word, of the term. So we were like little DPs, you know, in the, in the Canadian Jewish culture. And as a result, you know, we really didn't mix very much, you know, with the Canadian Jewish population, and practically not at all with the Canadian English population. Because the language you spoke at home? No, because of fear basically, and because um, the Canadian, Jewish po Canadian population didn't want to talk with us. And we didn't want to talk with them either because um, we assumed that there was a hostility and a great hostility present and there was no purpose in talking with uh, English Canadians. So this was your experience when you went to school in Toronto? Was this something that you... Mm -hmm. Um, no, this was my first experience, you know, like in just living and going out on the street. Like I was warned by my mother, don't go east of Young Street because you will be beaten up. Mm -hmm. That's what I was told explicitly. 
In other words, don't go and mix But was that your experience, or was that your mother's experience being transmitted to you? Well, I assumed that she knew what she was talking about. I wasn't going to risk it, <laughs> if you know, first of all. And uh, generally, you know, the experiences that I had, you know, seemed to confirm that. And um, because it was difficult enough, you know, getting along or being, you know, respected by the Canadian Jewish population, so I assumed that it would be much more difficult to uh, get along with the English Canadian population. The uh, Canadian Jewish population um, I met up with in uh, the Jewish school that I went to. Uh, before that, uh, we generally socialized only with the other refugee families. We tended to live in the same sector of the city, around Bathurst College area or Kensington area. And uh, we had our own association, which was called the Varshala Lodge uh, Mutual Benefit Society. And we had picnics in Hyde Park every year, and we'd all get together. And, uh, and then the adults would have their meetings. And uh, they would go to visit other families in the evening, who were also refugee families. And we generally conversed amongst ourselves in Yiddish. So I didn't learn English first, I learned Yiddish first. Because when my parents came, they didn't speak English. Of course. So to me, they spoke in Yiddish. And my mother more often than my father, because my father got a job as a, as a cleaner in the Oscar Hall Law School. So he worked in the evenings from 4 to 12, so I never saw him. And uh, so my mother spoke with me in Yiddish, but in the Warsaw dialect of Yiddish, which is the more cosmopolitan uh, Jewish uh, political culture in Poland. Whereas my father came from Lublin, which was a southern city, more agricultural area, and uh, poor, much poorer, and more religious than the Warsaw Jewish community. Although both my parents were orthodox in Jewish and religious persuasion, and, and maintained that when they, once they were in Toronto as well. Yes, they only went to uh, orthodox synagogues. At least my father did. My mother hardly went to synagogue at all because women didn't go to the synagogue. You know, um, and so I was obliged to go to the orthodox synagogue, and I was orthodox. I was raised orthodox, and uh, I was you know very believing you know. I consider the matter of Jewish identity to be Orthodox Jewish. In fact, you know, the other sort of uh, currents of uh, Judaic thought, uh, like uh, the conservative uh, trend or the reform trend, to me were not really Jewish. You know, I considered uh, the conservatives to be like Protestants. You're talking currently or even back then, growing up and observing around you, your peers? Well, that's, that's what I considered, you know, from the beginning. Okay. And, uh, I mean, if we want to get into, you know, my political evaluations of what those currents, you know, are presently, then they wouldn't be that much different, actually. Because I do consider conservative uh, and the reform tendencies to be a form of uh, Protestant thought, you know, which was, uh, you know, emerged out of the uh, Reformation in Europe, uh, which sought to... Uh, combine religious thought with national identity, and so uh, these currents uh, are basically, you know, the modernist tendency of Jewish political culture, which uh, express national identity in religious terms. However, okay, so I went to a, uh, a Jewish school uh, full-time at first. I didn't go to English school. I was sent to a Jewish full-time school in my first year. However, my cousin, who was Canadian Jewish and was, you know, a very well-educated uh, woman, uh, recommended to my mother that I be sent to a public school. And so the following year, I was changed to a public school. And because they didn't recognize the Jewish school, I was required to start again in the first year. And uh, because and also they probably, you know, felt that because my language skills were not the same as the other students that, uh, that I wasn't capable of studying to the same degree in, in all subject matters. So I was put back into the first year without any, um, you know, remedial courses, you know, without any sort of, you know, um, integration program. They had no integration program whatsoever. 
you know, I was a kid and I was on my own, and uh, and you know, injected into this this general sort of population, you know, of English students, with a few other Jewish students, uh, but not very many because there weren't many survivors. So, um, however. I still couldn't relate to the English students, even though I was in the same school as them. And I never spoke with other, you know, with other Canadian students. I didn't speak with the Canadians until about, until actually grade nine. It's a long time. Yes, the whole primary school experience. Oh. Uh, I wonder if we could uh, sure, we just take talk. a break. You know, sure. I'd like to invite this is my son. My son oh, is just wonderful. appeared. Yes, so perhaps oh, he my son uh, Celie uh, just uh, arrived, and uh, and so we took a break to open the door, and uh, I'd I'd like to uh, welcome him uh, to uh, view the interview here with uh, with us. Uh, this is my son Celie Weisfeld Castellan. Wonderful. Can we? Uh... Okay, turn. Just a little. Hi. Thank you. It's better to be I don't know. Uh, do you want to sit next to him while he moves under your feet? What do you think? Yeah, I think it's going to be better if he's sitting here. Experience, I hardly spoke with uh, Canadians at all. And it, uh, you know, it, it passed, you know, fairly well. I mean, nobody really was disturbed by this, you know, nobody really wanted to talk with me anyway, you know, because I was Jewish. So it was a mutually agreed uh, sense of alienation. <laughs> but in the school, there, there were just Christians in the public school that you were? And, and a few Jewish people a few Jewish students. There was one interaction that was notable uh, because uh, you know, this sort of you know, mutual silence between us worked except for the girls. Now, there was you know, one girl in particular, her name was Joanne, I'll never forget her name, who was very upset you know, that she didn't get my attention as she would easily have gotten the attention of any other, you know, Canadian boy. And it was more explicitly forbidden for me, in, in a religious sense, you know, not to speak with, you know, a Canadian girl, because I'm, I wouldn't possibly consider, you know, becoming a friend of a Canadian girl, because I would obviously only be oriented to uh, getting married with a Jewish girl. See, so there was this double sense of alienation with the Canadian girl. So Joanne was very upset by this, and during recess times, she had a whole gang of girls chasing me down in order to force me into some sort of social interaction. Mm -hmm. This went on like for weeks, and uh, and and finally, um, it so you became the forbidden fruit. So I mean, it, it became you know, sort of more sort of intense as, as time went on, you know, it was sort of uh, quite an experience. And I was very determined not to speak with her. And uh, finally I had to, you know, explain, you know, that I didn't want to speak with her and, and so I was obliged to speak with her as a result. So that seemed to, <laughs> to solve the, the, and the, uh, the situation for the time being. I'm sort of, I feel very sort of hot. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about I mean, Joanne? Or? <laughs> no, it, it's <laughs> because, you know, I sort of feel embarrassed, you know, that, uh, that I was so alienated, you know, but there was a, 
a, a great sense of uh, alienation. You know, but I'm interested. You, you, did you feel this was aggressive? These girls chasing you, or did you, or was there something seductive? There was something about you where they, I mean, girls do get interested in boys and chase them at a certain age, and yes. So I'm, I'm wondering, you know. No, it changed from, from being seductive to being a threat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I felt threatened, you know, because there was a large number of these girls, mm -hmm. and they were, uh, you know, um, like very intent on capturing me. Mm -hmm. And so and I felt. Uh, and since mm -hmm. I went through a bit the same, yeah. same thing myself, and it was kind of, you know, we we were trying to be apart, you know, not to bother anybody. Mm -hmm. And if we would try to socialize with a girl, then it would be like some kind of a attack or something, you know, because then we were starting to go on their territory. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like. It, if we have to exclude ourselves from the boys, then we have to exclude ourselves from the girls too, because otherwise it's like not, not a, that's what the way I see it, but you know what I mean. It's like the enemy lines are drawn and there's no crossing over or? Not so much enemy, you know, but uh, some kind of a threat. Mm -hmm. You know, if only in the sense that um, these girls wanted me to violate my own cultural code. You know, it was sort of an you know, enforced assimilation. And I was seeking to avoid assimilation because I wanted to maintain my national identity. I, uh, I didn't felt as assimilation, mm -hmm. I guess maybe because I've been more in this uh, community a little bit more than my dad. But I felt threatened myself in a way like uh, Boys would get aggressive with me, and uh, I would, uh, and you know, I would be forced almost to go in corners where there's no any, no one buddy, and all my recess I would stay there and write something and stay by myself, not to bother. Because of your Jewish identity in the school that you were in, or uh, yes, that too. But um, it started with that, and then there's other things that got around to it, but it's. Big part of this. Yes, you should realize that Sayli is one of the first Jewish students to go to the uh, francophone uh, educational system here mm -hmm. in Montreal, in Quebec. Because before it was, uh, it was not permitted. Jewish students were not permitted in the francophone educational system, which was called the Catholic Board of Education. And even at the time when I, I brought him into the primary school uh, francophone system here, c'était encore la commission scolaire catholique. And then it changed, you know, to the francophone, uh, you know, commission. But uh, there was no other Jewish students in the whole city at the time. No. Well, all the way through high school, I never met anyone who was Jewish. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, something parallel was also happening with me, with respect to the um, other students who were Jewish, but Canadian Jewish. Because we had a, when I went to the public educational system, I went to a Jewish school as well as the uh, oh, after school programs. Or? Yes, but it, it it was two hours a night mm -hmm. from seven until nine o'clock every night. Did you study Hebrew or? Ah, no. See, we were in a cheder, mm -hmm. which was a traditional Jewish Orthodox school, so the language taught. For oral communication was not Hebrew. It was Yiddish. It was Yiddish. But not your mother's Yiddish, your father's Yiddish, or? It was a European kind of Yiddish because the teachers were, uh, were of the older generation. There was Mr. Cohn, who was um, a modern Orthodox uh, teacher. He wasn't a rabbi, he shaved his beard, but he was a teacher. Then there was Mrs. Yakubovich, who was Hasid. You know, she was, you know, um, orthodox, ultra-orthodox. And she was a teacher of mine before Mr. Cohn. Mr. Cohn was of the higher, higher levels of education. And he was also my uh, bar mitzvah teacher. And then in the class we had, half of the class were Jewish refugee kids, and half the class were Canadian Jewish kids. We were in downtown, and we were in this, uh, in, in the school was in a synagogue called the uh, Beis Yehuda Talmud Torah. Well, this name of the synagogue was, uh, or Shul, as its name is in Yiddish. 
is the Yiddish name for him, for synagogue, was the Shul of Beis Yehuda, which means the house of God, basically. No, the house of, house of, house of Jews, sort of would be the simplest translation. The, the Jewish house of God, or something like that. And uh, with the Canadian Jewish students in the, in the classes, we didn't speak with them either, and they wouldn't speak with us. We, we were more interested in speaking with them than they were interested in speaking with us. And they would seek to avoid speaking with us because it was a question of status. Mm -hmm. Amongst the Canadian Jewish students mm -hmm. in the school, uh, they considered themselves to be superior because uh, they came from a better off family, first of all, because they were more integrated in society. They were second or third generation. And, uh, and also, uh, because our English wasn't as good as their English, they considered themselves to be superior. And also because we were DPs. Yes. So they didn't want to talk with us. Mm -hmm. However, you know, we cohabited, you know, in the same, uh, in the same school. We went through the bar mitzvah education and all that. And then afterwards, we had a bar mitzvah club. Now, in the bar mitzvah club, which meant every Sunday, we, uh, we didn't have any teachers around. So everything went, you know, like everything, there were no rules anymore. It was just, you know, like, like anarchy. So what happened is that um, one of the refugee kids, Arnold, he was elected president, you know, of the Bar Mitzvah Club. But he was more sort of integrated. He sort of, you know, passed as a Canadian Jewish kid. And so he was, you know, allowed to be president. But the others, they still didn't like us. And then one time we started to pretend to have a fight. And somehow the two teams got differentiated on the basis of either being a Canadian or being a, you know, a, a refugee kid. And then this battle, which took place, started to get more and more violent. And, you know, we started to use, you know, these little pieces of, of plywood that were left lying around for some reason. And they made excellent flying projectiles. And, uh, and we had, you know, like, uh, you know, um, embarkments, you know, mm -hmm. to protect mm -hmm. each side, you know, and we had like a full-scale war happening there that day. And then, uh, and they actually start to throw these things at us, you know, so uh, I took one of these and I aimed and, and I threw it and it actually sort of, you know, danced over the head of this guy. So then I just called the whole thing off and I just got up and I stopped the whole war and I said, no, we can't, you know, this is getting to be ridiculous, you know, we can't continue like this. And everybody agreed, and we stopped the war. Mm. However, we didn't speak to each other, nonetheless. So how did you understand that? How did I understand mm -hmm. that? That uh, that we taught them a lesson, that we know how to defend ourselves, and they had better not try to uh, you know assault us again. That's how I understood it. And, and they did agreed, they and they backed down. And something shifted after that. Or? Yes, they didn't. Uh, mm -hmm. They didn't sort of, you know, they were, there was more of a quietness between us. Whereas before there was, you know, this uh, harshness, you know, harsh or the threat, as tone of voice, you, you know, on their part, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it was really tough. Did you feel less threatened after it? Um, I don't know about that, mm -hmm. but I felt more pride in myself, mm -hmm. you know, for having stood up to them and knowing that I could do so again and knowing that they knew that I could, and them knowing that I knew that I knew mm -hmm. that I could. And that you also exercised enough control to stop it. Once you threw yes. it, oh, you yes. also didn't let it go further and to actually degenerate into violence. Yes, yes, so I, I guess they appreciated that. But they didn't express any such appreciation. So it was just, you know, quite a deal. I have, I, I just need to get you a little closer, sorry, uh, no, this way here is good, yeah, so this way at least, yeah. yeah, that's good, maybe here, it's good, I, I have a question here, um, uh, 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 did the Jewish kids, they, did they speak about the war, or did they speak about the Holocaust, or did they know about what had happened to you? Nobody talked about the Holocaust. Neither us, nor our parents, nor the media, nor the school, 
nobody. Until one day in grade six, my first act of rebellion was when this teacher and uh, he was talking, giving a history class and he was on the side blackboard closer to me on my side of the class and I was sitting in one of the back seats. I always sat in the back because I didn't want to be looked at, you know, by the students, by the other students. And right in the middle of some explanation of something, he goes completely out of context and he makes reference to how the Jews in the Middle Ages killed Christian babies. So, you know, I hear this and like without thinking, I just jumped up, I pointed at him and I said in a loud voice, that's a lie. Now, the teacher, oh, sorry, I'll let you finish. The teacher, he, he, he was so shocked, he just stood there, you know, like with his hand still up at the board and he, he was paralyzed, he couldn't move, you know, he didn't know what to say. And the students, they were so frightened that they also were paralyzed. It was like a general neurotic trance that I induced, you know, with those words. And this lasted, you know, for about seven seconds until finally I realized that uh, nobody here was going to be able to cope with this. Mm -hmm. And I just slowly sat down and uh, we all pretended that nothing had happened and the teacher went on with his class. I have a very similar experience myself. Uh, when I arrived in high school, uh, this uh, we were in, uh, in this uh, moral class, 